Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar, How Well Are We Serving Our Female Students in STEM? Brought to you by Evaluate, the Evaluation Resource Center for the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program. I'm Jason Burkhardt, the Project Manager at Evaluate. And here with me today is Lori Wingate, PI for Evaluate, and our special guest, Donna Milgram. Donna is Executive Director of the National Institute for Women in Trades, Technology, and Science, or IWITS. She is also the PI for the Cal Women Tech Scale-Up Project. To help you keep track of who's saying what today, we've put the presenter's picture and name in the upper right corner of each slide. This is a good time to point out that the views expressed by our presenters today are theirs and theirs alone and don't necessarily reflect those of NSF. Behind the scenes uh, working with us today, uh, Laura Sanchez uh, from Maytech, uh, an ATE center at Maricopa Community Colleges, who helps host all of Evaluate's webinars. By the end of this webinar today, we hope you'll learn why gathering gender data is critical, the nuts and bolts of collecting the enrollment and retention data, how to assess the effectiveness of strategies to improve the recruitment and retention of women in STEM programs, and how to use that data to leverage change. Before we start, I'd like to take a few moments to orient you to some things that you'll need to know to make you the most of your time with us. First, let's review the platform. The chat box is where you should type in your questions and or comments. You can type those in at any time. And be sure to send those to this room so that everyone can follow the conversation. We'll take a few question and answer breaks throughout the webinar, and I'll be keeping track of those questions so that we can address them during the breaks. If you have a technical issue, then you can choose just to send it to the moderators uh, for the webinar, and they'll help you resolve it. So let's practice using that chat box right now. Using the box, please type the name of the organization you're from and how many people are viewing this webinar with you today. While you're typing, I'll point out one more thing about the webinar platform, which is the participants box. Here you'll find a list of everyone who is attending this webinar. You'll most likely see people you know, and it's fine to send them notes, but you should know that the moderators do see everything anyone types into the chat box. Okay, so it looks like we've got people from all over and lots of great participants, so I'd like to, uh, let's move on. Lastly, I want to make sure everyone knows how to raise their hand. Right under the participant list, you should see a small hand. When you click that button, it raises your virtual hand in the chat room. Let's try that right now. So let's go ahead and... All right, very good. It looks like everyone has a good sense of how to use that. So now we're just about to start, but let me address a few more things that always come up. Right after this webinar, I'll email you a handout that includes links and key points that are brought up today. It will also be available along with the slides in our digital resource library, as you can see there on the screen. I'd like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available in a few days, and I'll email you the link when it's ready for viewing. So with no further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Lori Wingate to talk about women in ATE. Thanks, Jason. Um, so Donna is going to present most of the content for this webinar, but I wanted to start us off by grounding this issue of evaluating the engagement of women in, in STEM in the context of NSF's priorities. In the most recent strategic plan that NSF has, they clearly convey their commitment to broadening participation. It further states in the strategic plan that tomorrow's, this is a quote, tomorrow's STEM workforce must draw on the talents and interests of all sectors of the nation's diverse population. And this is by, by um, in especially engaging underrepresented portions of the population. And by underrepresented, excuse, sorry about that, they're really talking about women, minorities, and persons with disabilities. And of course, for this webinar, we are focusing on the issue of getting more women into technician education programs and how to assess recruitment and retention initiatives focused on women. So um, you just learned how to raise your hand. So I want to know how many of you are currently involved with an NSF-funded project? If you currently have an NSF F grant or working on one or evaluating in some capacity, if you could just raise your hand and we'd get a quick count. That would be great. A lot of hands going up. Okay, about half of you. Okay, great. And so of those of you um, who don't yet have 
NSF funding, or aren't working on an NSF grant. Um, how many of you are either working on a proposal or are thinking about um, submitting a proposal soon? If, if you could raise your hand. OK. So it looks like it's going to be about half and half. OK. So for those of you in the latter group, I hope you'll join us in August. Um, we're going to have a webinar on developing evaluation plans for proposals. And Jason will have more information on that a little bit later. So whether you have a grant or you're hoping to get one from NSF, you want to keep in mind those NSF review criteria for what they call broader impacts and intellectual merit. And these are the criteria that reviewers use to assess all NSF proposals. So I want to highlight the broader impacts criteria especially, because this is where um, the concern with engaging underrepresented populations really shows up, as you can see here in this question on the screen, which is just one of a handful of the sub-criteria under this um, umbrella of broader impacts. Because the broader impacts and the intellectual merit criteria are what drives NSF's proposal reviews, I can assure you that reaching underrepresented groups is extremely important to um, NSFPIs, at least when they're preparing their proposals. But you do want to be careful to keep this on your radar throughout the life of your project. Not, not only is it inherently important you know, to strive, continually strive to improve the balance of groups represented in STEM fields, when you want to go back to NSF for more funding, you're going to have to report on your activities and achievements in that area. In fact, the ATE program solicitation in particular requires that um, project descriptions, and this is the 15-page proposal narrative, that those start with a subsection called result of prior NSF support. And the solicitation further explains that this is where you're going to convey the specific outcomes um, and the results of your project, include metrics that demonstrate the impact of your work, and provide evidence of the quality and effectiveness of the project's deliverables. That's the ATE program solicitation. The overall NSF grant proposal guide, um, which is for agency-wide, this specifies that this section on prior support should describe accomplishments related to broader impact activities supported by the, the award. And again, key piece of that broader impact is engaging underrepresented populations. So there are some pretty direct implications for you as you think about getting and maintaining NSF support. You really do need to take the issue of broadening impacts, um, broadening participation pretty seriously throughout your project. Keep it on your radar and build it into your evaluation activities. So as many of you know, um, Evaluate conducts a survey every year of all ATE PIs. And um, 230 PIs completed this survey this year, which is an amazing 92% of all ATE PIs. And of these, 120 indicated that they supported an instructional program with their grants. So in most of this group, 109, or 91%, also reported their numbers of men and women in that program. So that's pretty good representation um, of all ATE PIs. And Based on the numbers reported by this group of 109, we know that recruiting and retaining women in technician programs is an ongoing challenge for community colleges. About one in five students in ATE-supported programs is female. But we do see quite a lot of variation um, across disciplines. Uh, so in this chart, we can see that biotech is doing pretty well here with over half of their students um, being female, but most of the disciplines that are at least those that are listed on our um, on our survey, they have less than 25 percent of their students um, being women. So let's take a look at how this shapes up longitudinally. Now we have data here to evaluate on women in ATE going all the way back to the year 2000. The way we've asked the question has changed over that time, um, but it's been pretty stable since about 2006. So that's why I have selected 2006 through the most current year here. Um, you can see based on these data, we've had, it looks like an overall decline in the representation of women in ATE, um, although we do have a lot more respondents um, in 2010 and 2011 for these demographic questions than we had in prior years because we moved where the question appeared in the survey. So we have almost three times as many people answering here, which could affect the percentages. But anyway, you look at it, um, it's pretty clear that the number of women 
um, in technician education programs supported by ATE is grossly disproportionate in relation to the overall enroll enrollments at two-year colleges, as we can see here in purple, is um, all two-year colleges. And these figures are from the uh, National Center for Education Statistics. And their most recent data is um, through 2010. And if you like statistics, um, NCES has a wealth of information to, my, to mine for evaluation purposes. I'm going to give you an example here. Um, this is from their Education Digest. And they have data, um, among many other things, they have data on associate's degrees awarded. And you can review, review these by um, program area and gender, as well as race and ethnicity, so it's pretty interesting. These are um, based on IPEDS data, and I know a lot of you are familiar with, with that system. But their categories of disciplines are don't align perfectly with those that we use in ATE, but there were three categories that matched up really well. And this was information and communications technologies, engineering technologies, and agricultural and natural resources. And then according, according to these data for 2010, we see that ATE is actually doing a little bit better overall than the nation um, in terms of the representation of women in these program areas anyway. So the um, all two year colleges there is in purple, and ATE is represented in orange. So that looks pretty good for ATE. Um, in the handout that we're going to send you, the, I do have the URL to access the NCES data and their Education Digest. Um, they have hundreds of tables you can either view online or download um, and be able to work with in Excel directly. They have um, statistics on things like enrollment, degrees awarded, student demographics, even faculty demographics. And you can look at these in a number of ways, like program area, type of institutions. Um, it's, it's really a lot of interesting data here. Um, it could be used for benchmarking. You may also want to check out a report that we put out a, a year or two ago. It's a 10-year trend report on women in ATE. We also have a link for that on our handout. And this report includes a lot of the details on how the question was asked over time, which has some implications for the, the results and the interpretations of those. Um, but that's on our website, and you can access that and, and learn a lot more about um, the trends in, in women's participation in ATE, as well as um, issues with regard to measuring their participation. Now, finally, I want to highlight a resource I discovered just late last week, so I don't have a lot of details on it. But this is a screenshot from the website for the AWE project. Um, for, it stands for Assessing Women and Men in Engineering. And I haven't had time to dig into all their, their stuff, but they have really a lot of, looks like a lot of useful uh, materials. They have um, surveys uh, to get feedback on diversity activities, retention, um, classroom environments, recruiting efforts. They've also got literature reviews, um, an online tool for tracking activities and participants, among other things. Um, you do have to register to access these, but it's free, so it's really not a problem. And they also have webinars that orient you to their materials and provide guidance on adapting them for your own context. This is for engineering, but has a lot of applicability, um, at least at a first glance, to other, to other areas. So I encourage you to check that out for yourself. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Donna now. But um, if you have questions for me, I'll be happy to address those after um, um, Donna's next section when we have our first question break. So thanks a lot, and I'll turn it over to Donna. I want to start off by thanking the Evaluate Center and Lori Wingate for doing this webinar on women's participation in ATE. I think this is so important, and obviously when you listen to evaluate numbers, it really underscores why it's important to collect gender segregated data. And obviously, this is a topic I'm very passionate about. And we did this successfully in our Cal Women Tech project, which was highlighted by the National Science Foundation for demonstrating significant achievement and program effectiveness. I was the principal investigator for this project between 2006 and 2011. And we provided expert support and technical assistance to eight community colleges in California to help them recruit and retain women into technology programs where they were underrepresented. And we now have another National Science Foundation grant, Cal Women Tech Scale Up, to bring that work even further. I am going to show you the kinds of data that we collected in the project as an example 
um, and also give you the nuts and bolts and even a template of how to go about that for your own projects. Now, before we get started, I want to give you my very best today. And I want to ask you to do something to help me with that, which is, could you please give me a smiley face if you like what I'm saying? And hopefully you will like what I'm saying, and so I'll hopefully get lots of smiley faces. If you don't like what I'm saying, please don't give me a thumbs down. But I'd love some smiley faces. And I see a bunch there, which is just great. Thank you so much. Now, I want to see who's here. And so I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you're an external evaluator. Can you raise your hand if you're an external evaluator? Have an external? OK, we have uh, six external evaluators. OK, great. And raise your hand if you're an instructor or professor. Raise your hand if you're an instructor or professor. OK, I see we have 10 instructors or professors, 11. Great. And raise your hand if you're a counselor or you do outreach. Counselor or do outreach. OK, great. We have uh, nine people who fit into that category. And raise your hand if you don't fit into the four categories that I just mentioned. You're in another category. OK, actually, quite a few people. Um, I'm going to guess that uh, perhaps we have administrators here. Raise your hand if you're an administrator. OK, great. And uh, last question, raise your hand if you have attended a Women Tech Educators training in the past. OK, we have a few people. Great. OK, and the last thing that I want to ask you is, how many of you are currently collecting gender data by career pathway. How many of you currently do this? Raise your hands. Oh, great. About 13 of 45 are actually doing this. Good. And then last question, how many of you would like to collect gender data, data um, by career pathway? Raise your hand. Would like to do this in the future. Great. OK, uh, another 15 people. Super. So I am now going to move into why gathering gender data is so critical. And I want to start off by taking a look at the data from one of our Cal Women Tech sites, City College of San Francisco. And what you can see, this was actually a chart developed by our external evaluators. And you can see here that the baseline is 19% uh, uh, for female enrollment in computer networking and information technology. And this was before we started the project. And the baseline was taken over four semesters. And then you can see that there were um, increases that could be measured. And it was not a straight line. Uh, we went up. Uh, it actually went down uh, when the project started to 15 percent. Then it went up. You can see to 33 percent. Went up and down. But overall, in the aggregate, the percentage of females enrolled increased over the course of the project. And because we collected this data, we could show our sites. In this case, City College of San Francisco these charts and so that they could see how they were doing. And so that was on the enrollment side. And we focused on introductory courses because those are the courses without prerequisites that you can impact immediately. We also looked at advanced courses later on when there was an increased number of women in the introductory course pipeline. And there were increases there as well. Let me now show you the retention data example, and the pink are the females, uh, and the blue are the males. And so we also measured 
the completion rate for females and males, because we did a comparative, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And again, you see that it was not a straight line overall. Um, the baseline started out with 64% uh, female uh, retention, uh, significantly lower than the male retention, 72%. Uh, and that uh, towards the end of the project, you see the much higher numbers over here for both female completion rates as well as male completion rates. And that was one of the really great things that we could see in the project, which is that wherever we increased uh, completion rates for females, we also increased completion rates for the male students as well. And so we did a comparative not only looking at increases for females alone, but how that compared to the males. And so I uh, am, want to mention a couple of things, which is that it's really important not to look simply at if the female retention rate increased but also to look at the bigger picture so that if you have a class in which the retention rates are low overall, and we had a number of those, then it's going to be important to compare the female retention rate to the male retention rate, both at baseline and also later on and in the aggregate. And so we both did the comparative and we looked at the retention rates and how much they increase for females alone and for males alone. And then we could see the progress within the genders as well as if there was a difference in retention rate between females and males. And so you know, your goal is zero. It's not going to be exactly the same, but uh, your goal is to have them be more or less equivalent. What you don't want to do is say, we're going to have all females complete at a rate of 80%. You need to do it in relationship to what the male completion rate is, because if you have a class in which overall everybody has a low number, then you want to take that into account. And again, I'm happy to say that wherever we increased retention of females, and that was in four out of our seven sites, um, then we increased the retention rate of the males as well. The male retention rate actually increased in in uh, all of our sites, all seven of our sites. OK, so also on a bigger picture level, let's take a look at why it's so important to have the kind of data that we had in our project. And one of the things that I want to say, I have many years of working in this field, is that whenever you're looking at a group of which there's very few, whether it's females in STEM, or it's minority students, or students of color, in STEM, whenever there's only a few, there's a skewed perception often that they're much larger in number than they actually are. And there is actually sociological literature about this dynamic. And so it's often the case that you'll hear anecdotes and stories from instructors and professors or, or counselors, and they'll talk about things that don't actually match the actual numbers. So it's very, very important to get the actual numbers. And I want to actually give you a story where the, and it's from City College of San Francisco. It's actually a little bit different than what I just talked about. But it's a good example of why it's so important to have the data. So City College of San Francisco, they really wanted to be so on top of things. Uh, and they were concerned. It was their impression that women were not doing as well, and they were dropping out at a higher rate in the online courses. And the online courses have become a much bigger part of uh, the curriculum, uh, well, actually, of the classes offered, I should say. And so they really were concerned that since uh, online teaching was increasing, and they felt that females were dropping out at a higher rate, that if we didn't address this, this could have some very negative impacts. So I'm happy to say that both our external evaluators and also the Institutional Data Department of City College of San Francisco stretched a bit and did a special run over several semesters of time 
on the online training courses alone from a gender segregated perspective. And so we took a special look. And what is so interesting is that we actually found that the female students were retained at a significantly higher rate in the online training than in the real time training in the classroom face to face. Now, I wish I could tell you why that was. I actually had run out and started to do a literature review, and we hired a librarian to help us with this, about gender differences in participation with regards to online training. And I'm sad to say that there was nothing available, very little, almost nothing, and perhaps because it's so recent. So I'm not able to tell you why this is. But the point that I really want to make here is that we would have gone down a completely different track with a intervention that would not have been an appropriate intervention because of an impression and an anecdote. And so that's why it's so critical, especially when dealing with women and kids as minorities to get the actual data. Now, finally, what I can tell you that I think is so important is that our external evaluators collected this data as soon as the schools could provide it. And they did separate runs on enrollment and on retention, again, so that the data could become available to the sites as close as possible to real time. And this ended up being a few months after uh, the actual begin of the semester or the completion of the semester. So it wasn't exactly real time, but it was pretty close. And so often, I have found this kind of data is provided over a year out. And when it's provided over a year out, it's really not going to be able to inform project strategies. So it's so important to provide this within a few months' time. And this way, administrative professors, uh, instructors, they could tell if what they were doing was effective. And it also provided positive validation for the schools because uh, six out of seven of them had an increase of enrollment for the female students. And as I mentioned earlier, four out of seven had increases in retention for female students. And uh, actually, all seven uh, schools had increases for male retention. And so there was really uh, energy that they got from being able to see their positive outcomes as the, pro as the uh, project progressed. Similarly. There were times uh, that things weren't working, and I'll share some examples of that with you in a bit. So then it was an opportunity to analyze why and to try some new strategies. OK, so I'm now going to stop for a minute so I can answer any questions that you have on what we've covered so far. And I see that uh, there have been some questions, and so I will move to our questions and answer period. OK, thanks, Donna. So uh, we have uh, several questions here from the audience. Uh, the first one coming from Peggy. And the question is, what is the approximate size of the sample uh, in your evaluation? Yes, that is a great question, Peggy. And I am going to be talking later about some of the limitations <laughs> of uh, this method of collection. And one of the limitations you just hit upon, which is that we could not, in fact, get an exact N. And that is uh, what we, what I will be going into a, uh, an example chart a little bit later that shows that we ended up with an average number of women per class. And I'll go into more detail about how we did it, why we did it that way. But that was the best that we were able to do with the community college's existing data collection ability. And we weren't able to find alternative models that did it better. It's um, how, what we ultimately came up with with our National Advisory Committee that included AACC and uh, the League for Innovation. And so that was a limitation. OK, very good. Uh, the next question is from Sally. 
And it is, how are you measuring retention? Are you measuring from just one semester to the next, or is there a different method that you use to measure retention? Also a good question. Also uh, something I'm going to be addressing in more detail about limitations. And so how we measured retention was within the course. As uh, Sally probably knows, and uh, everyone else on this webinar, uh, the whole issue of persistence within community colleges is a big one. And community colleges do not collect data in a way that enables um, one to, eat, to see persistence. Most colleges do not. Of course, community college students definitely participate in a different way than four-year college students. And so again, with the advice of our National Advisory Committee members, we had to look at uh, persistence and completion within the course. And we specifically uh, also nailed it down um, with the help of our sites to after uh, census, a particular time period uh, that happened at the beginning of the semester. And so that is how we measured completion. OK, great. Thank you. And uh, another question from Karen. Do you ever collect data on what STEM outreach programs students attended in K through 12, or what schools or districts supported hands-on projects that develop STEM skills? This would be a uh, long term to see if these students studied a STEM field in college or went on to a, a related career. So gosh, I would love to do that. <laughs> that would be a very, uh, very big grant that would enable us to do that. And it would be something that I would love to do. I really, really value data, as you can see. And so that was not something that was within the scope of our grant. Uh, there have been a few longer term studies uh, that are in our proven practices collection. Um, I'll just mention it's uh, on our website, which is www.iwitz.org. And so I have uh, really tried to identify for our proven practices collection, and we have over 100 articles that we're also uh, updating, some longer term strategies. Uh, there is one study that is actually from Ryerson University in Canada that we have several articles on in the recruitment section that does actually look at persistence uh, from interventions at a high school level to uh, the university level. Uh, that is one of uh, only a couple of studies that I know that do this and uh, you know, do have this type of connection specifically with regard to women and girls in STEM. Uh, and there just are certainly not as many, there are very few. Um, I wish that we would get a grant that would enable us to do that. I would love to do that. This particular grant is not something uh, that was within the uh, scope of what we were doing. OK, excellent. And it looks like we had another question come up. Uh, does the term complete equate to successful completion or just passing a course? So. When you are making the distinction between successful completion and passing a course, I think what I'm intuiting in that question is a certain grade level. And so we did not look at the level of a grade level. Again, that was beyond our scope and capacity for this particular grant. But they did have to successfully pass. And, uh, but we did not look at the grade level. That would be a good thing to look at, and, uh, but it was not within our scope. OK, excellent. All right, those were some excellent questions. Um, and also, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, you'll get to uh, view these again uh, so that you can review the answers to those. OK, so now we'd like to turn it back over to Donna to discuss the nuts and bolts of data collection. Great. Well, thank you. Those were some really great questions. And I'm going to probably expand on some of the things that I just uh, talked about in this section. And what you actually see here is a template that our external evaluators developed for the college sites that we're working with. And we actually provided this to you 
as a handout. And so this particular one is for introductory courses. Uh, we also have provided you with one for advanced courses, uh, one that is a combination of the, of the uh, advanced and introductory, as well as one that is for an individual course. And so let me walk you through this template. And of course, when our external evaluators provided it to the sites, uh, it has formulas in it. The one you will get, uh, because of course we don't know your courses, will not have formulas. But let me give you the concept so that you can understand it. First of all, what I would like to point out is that here we have the baseline, and it is over four semesters. And I just want to say how important it is that the baseline be collected prior to the project and to do it at least over four semesters, because you don't want to just take one course and have that be the baseline. And so that's one thing that I want to point out to you. And of course, you are going to have to determine which courses you are going to be targeting. Obviously, there are going to be courses in which women and girls are underrepresented in STEM in those particular courses. And our National Advisory Committee ended up recommending that the schools choose three to five courses to target. Now, depending upon the size of the schools, they might have uh, multiple sections, of course, of a particular course. And in this example here, I'm showing you that there was CNIT, Computer Networking and Information Technology 103 and 104. That might be up to five different courses. And there might be, in fact, uh, many multiple sections of those courses, which is why they ended up uh, doing the average number of uh, female students combined across these multiple course levels. So you see here that we've got the total number of students, the number of females, the number of males. There's always a certain percentage of gender unknown. And then what the percentage of females are at baseline. And that was done for each of the semesters that were measured within the project, it's noted down here when there was a, a course not offered during a particular semester. And then at the end of the, the uh, time period, that is when there was an average summary for enrollment. So that would be in this row here. This is the average summary at the very end of the project. And so then on the completion side, you see the number of uh, females, the number of males, the percentage of uh, females completing at baseline, in this case 62.3%, percentage of males completing 71.6%. And we have a column for the difference, percentage difference between males and females. And in this particular example, it was almost 10% difference. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, template that the schools filled out, and the charts that I showed you a little bit earlier were populated by this data. Now, I want to uh, share some of the limitations of this methodology, which I talk talked a little bit about in the question and answer period. And so the first one is because we were looking at multiple courses over time, many of which had multiple sections, we got an average N of women. And we could not answer the question, what is the total number of women in the program? And that was frustrating for us. But the way that the schools tracked the data, we were not able to distinguish if we were tracking the same woman, um, the same women across multiple courses or unique women. So this was not so much a limitation of how our external evaluators collected the data. But it was a limitation of how rudimentary many of the community colleges data collection systems were that we were working with. Now, the other disadvantage, whenever you're working with any group that is underrepresented, so therefore small in numbers, is that because our external evaluators chose to go with averages, if you had a 
one particular course, two women, for example, and one dropped out, then you suddenly had only a 50% retention rate, which got averaged in and really skewed our percentages. So that was also a disadvantage. However, we didn't come across another model that showed a better way of doing this, in particular with community college data, which is what we were working with. And I'm sure that I probably don't need to tell those of you who are on this webinar how limited the resources are for community colleges and data collection. The capacity of the schools that we worked with really varied. In some cases, uh, like City College of San Francisco, they were a leader in the state, very sophisticated. They were able to do that special run for us on the online training, for example. But then we worked with colleges where they didn't even have an internal person. It was contracted out. So that really varied. Now, one of the things that is always an issue is how do we get the data that we need when you run a project, as we did with our Cal Woman Tech project, which was funded by the National Science Foundation. How do we get the data from the sites on gender? And so I'm going to share with you what we did. We did a couple things. Um, one is that the colleges were getting free training and technical assistance over a several year period from, from us. And in order to become a site, they had to fill out an application in order to uh, be selected. We had more sites uh, apply, potential sites, than we had spots. And so this included the application process, letters of commitment from the president of the college as well as the dean of the relevant STEM department. And we had specific language that needed to go into the application that, that said we will ensure that this data is provided on enrollment and completion each semester in a timely fashion. They had to sign off on that specific statement. So that was a requirement. But probably even more important was that as part of their application, they had to fill out a template, such as the one that I just showed you, with their baseline data for the courses that they were targeting. And that not only gave us the numbers that we needed to see if, in fact, they were good candidates and met our grant requirements for participating as a site, namely that they had to be under underrepresented in that particular STEM career pathway for women, but it also provided evidence to us that they could, in fact, collect this gender segregated data that we needed. Now, having said that, I do have to tell you, it was not always easy for us to get the data. But it was something that the schools had made a commitment to, and we ultimately did get the data from all of the schools each semester. And I'm sure that was because we were so explicit about this, and it was part of their application to us. And it was something that we emphasized in the program planning and also in our real-time meetings, um, which the external evaluators attended when all the sites got together once a year. So that's part of what helped us. And so one other thing that I want to mention, I, um, I mentioned a little bit in the question and answer period, is that we have the schools target three to five courses uh, on the advice of our National Advisory Committee. And I've mentioned it included the League of Innovation and the Community College and the American Association of Community Colleges. And again, uh, because of the limitation of the community college data collection system, we were not able to track students sequentially for persistence within a program. And so there was another uh, disadvantage of this method, which is that some of our schools recruited female students, but then they um, enrolled in related introductory courses that were not part of the original target group. And so then the schools were upset because they didn't get credit when the female students chose a related course that were not part of the original target group. And our external evaluators tried to backtrack. However, our resources were limited for evaluation. So the best we could do was reference where we had evidence this had happened without including these numbers in the original tables. I hope you can understand what I'm talking about. It's quite, quite complicated. But, um, but I, I think that you can see what happened here. You know, this is just the reality of having 
limited resources because it would have been great if we could have tracked all the courses. However, it's not very likely that any project would have the funds to do so. So it was a case of having to choose the best course of action on these sticky issues, which I'm imparting to you. OK, so I'm sure you have more questions. And I am now going to uh, open up for another question and answer uh, period. OK, great. Thanks. We do have a few more questions. I'd like to encourage anybody to uh, enter your questions in the chat box if you have any additional ones. So Jill asks, can baseline data also be collected uh, during the first year of the project? And uh, also, could you use student IDs as a way to help track or to link the data together? So those are two separate questions. But. OK. So good question about can you track baseline data in the first year of the project? What I can tell you is that on the enrollment side, well, I, I, let me see. I want to make sure I understand that question. So I think that what you're asking is, uh, can you track baseline data that actually when the project's going on in that year? If, if you're asking, can you collect the baseline after you start the project, but it's from the two years prior, of course you can do that. If what you're asking, on the other hand, is can you um, collect the baseline data in the first year of the project because the assumption is the interventions will not have taken hold yet, I can tell you that's likely true on the enrollment side because our colleges did not see gains in enrollment because of the timing with semesters, et cetera, for about a year's time. It took a little bit over a year to see gains on the enrollment side. And it was actually a little bit quicker for uh, the more computer-oriented courses, such as uh, CMIT, Computer Networking Information Technology, and GIS. For the more uh, trades-oriented courses, such as auto technology, it took up more like a year and a half. So in fact, in that case, our sites made um, arguments to external violators that it would not have been possible to have uh, had an impact on an enrollment perspective. And so we did actually end up including uh, that those first semesters as part of the baseline on enrollment. But that was not true on the completion side because we did see impacts because, of, because of many of our uh, interventions had to do with uh, changing cl classroom teaching. And so those were things that once the teachers received our Women Tech Educators training could literally go back to their class you know, that next day. And some of them could be implemented right away in terms of uh, some of the things, not all of them. And so we actually, in that case, saw increases in retention the very next semester's data. So uh, this is sort of hard because of the fact that you're doing it uh, via a chat box. But um, I'm hoping that that answered your question on your first question. Then your second question is, you know, could in fact you um, use a unique identifier? Sure, of course you could do that. The problem was that, again, the community colleges uh, really have very little resources for doing uh, the institutional data collection. Often, we were lucky if there was one full-time person. City College of San Francisco is a very big college with multiple campuses. So they had uh, several people in a department. But as I said, with some of our schools, they used an external consultant. And so definitely using a unique identifier would be a great way to go. But we did not find that that was part of what our schools were doing. OK, great. Thanks. And we do have one last question. So is there any additional advice for PIs or evaluators on how to go about obtaining these kinds of data from the institutional research or institutional effectiveness offices? So in terms of uh, how to obtain it, they were provided with the uh, template that I showed you uh, a moment ago. And 
then they were expected to uh, return it. And in some cases, there were, the external evaluators had a direct relationship with that uh, data department. And that was mostly the case when it was a larger department with some resources. When we had a situation with uh, one of our colleges, for example, where it was an external person who was being paid as a consultant, then we had to work through the dean of that department who had to allocate some financial resources to making that happen. And so it varied. What I can tell you overall is that it was uh, something that was part of uh, what we we had, well, we had, had monthly support and strategy sessions with our key leaders over the phone once a month. And so we would bring this up in our monthly phone calls uh, if the external evaluators had let us know that the school still had not provided them with the data. So there was a lot of follow-up. And the follow-up was done by the external evaluators, but we worked in partnership with them if the school was not coming through uh, with their data. And their relationships, I, again, uh, were both with the institutional data departments uh, when possible, but then sometimes they had to be through an administrator. Or we had to ask that uh, administrator or the dean uh, to follow up with the institutional data department. So there was a lot of follow up. And again, I think it's because we normalized that this was part of the process and it was just you know, it was something that was on the agenda something that they knew needed to take place every semester, both at the uh, beginning of semester for enrollment and at the end for completion. OK, well, thank you. So we uh, are going to move on to the next section of the webinar. And we'll continue to catch questions from the chat box during the next uh, Q&A break. Uh, so I'd like to turn it back over to Donna for assessing strategies for improving female recruitment and retention. Great. Well, once again, some really good questions. I uh, really love these kinds of nuts and bolts questions. Well, my next section here is how to measure if the strategies you are using are reaching your female students and if they're helpful. And so how do you tell if the strategies you use are effective and also which strategies were most effective. And I just showed you looking at enrollment and retention uh, data. But that, of course, is really a gross measure. And our external evaluators went further than that. And they developed a survey for the female students that was distributed among the colleges. And the female students responded anonymously. And the survey was a combination of looking at both the classroom strategies that the instructors had been trained on, as well as looking at recruitment and demographics of the population. And the first time we gave the survey, we had an N of 60 students across the colleges respond. And I'm going to show you what we asked them related to the classroom and show you some of their responses. And let me just preface this by saying that I'm only showing you partially the data because my main focus here is showing you the process. There were actually 26 strategies that we had trained instructors on during the Woman Tech Educators training. We distilled it down to 26 classroom strategies. And the external evaluators asked the female students if they had experience have you experienced the strategy? And if they had experienced them, if they were helpful or very helpful, they aggregated that data for this chart. And if they had not experienced them, if they were interested in doing stuff. So you see, have not experienced, interested, not interested. And you can see that we have the count here for the number that actually had experience. So let me just give you. Um, a few as an example. So the, the number one strategy was actually learned basic skills needed for the course during the first few weeks of a course. This is a building block strategy or a bridge skill strategy. And 
we see that 49 out of the 60 respondents, the, uh, the female students, had experienced it, so we're happy to see that, and 100% rated it as helpful or very helpful. And of the only six female students who had not experienced it, half, 50%, wanted to. Another strategy that rated highly was the instructor demonstrated or modeled uh, before we did lab activities, uh, something else that we teach in the training. And again, we were happy to see that 52 out of the 60 had experienced it, and 98% rated it as helpful or very helpful. And of uh, the only three women who had not um, experienced it, uh, actually eight, uh, two-thirds of them were interested in experiencing it. I'll just give you one more example. Participated equally with males during hands-on activities. We see that 47 out of the 60 had experienced it, and 96% had rated it as helpful or very helpful. And so one of the great things was that by doing this kind of survey, we could see, first of all, if the training that we have provided to the instructors, the Women Tech Educators training, if that actually reached down and got implemented in the classroom. And in fact, we saw that the majority of our strategies had been experienced by the majority of the female students. So that was wonderful to see. And we could also see which strategies were the most helpful, and also strategies that uh, more students would like to experience but had not yet experienced. That was something that we could see as well. And so that also guided the strategies of the project. And I'll give you an example of that. I remember working with one of the colleges on their strategic plan and when we looked at the data for their individual school, they found that the female students had found additional open lab time very helpful. However, about half of the students had yet to experience additional open lab time, and they wanted to do so. And so they actually then fed that information into their revision of the strategic plan for that coming year, and they figured out a way how to provide additional open lab time at no cost, and that actually was provided not only to the female students, but also to the male students as well. And so that's an example of how this kind of data guided the sites in their interventions. And we also looked at some other things in addition to classroom strategies. And if we look at this uh, next question, uh, the external evaluators asked, overall, how would you describe the classroom environment in your technology courses? And we can see here that 73% of the respondents indicated very positive, 14% slightly positive, and 14% neutral. None responded negative. And that was great because a very important part of what we brought to the Cal Women Tech Project and as part of our Women Tech Educators training is how to ensure a positive classroom environment even when you have initially very few female students in STEM. Another question that we asked was, have you ever had a negative experience in a technology class? And you can see that 22% did say yes. What you don't see in the open-ended detail that we had and, and was coded was that the responses actually didn't have to do with gender, but they did have to do with the quality of the teachers teaching. And one of the colleges, because of getting this uh, kind of anonymous data, went and did uh, teacher observations to try to identify what uh, teacher uh, or teachers might not be doing a good job in their teaching. And they did identify a newer teacher they were able to coach that teacher. And again, this provided them with that kind of information so that they could take action. And that was something that they really liked. Another question, would you recommend another female enroll in your technology-related course or program? 100% said yes. That was great. Again, 
showing that we should continue to do what we're doing on classroom environment, but we didn't need to do further work on that per se. Now, we also were able to get demographics of the female students. And we found this also informed the schools. Uh, you can see that two-thirds of the students were uh, women of color. And uh, that is reflective of uh, our diversity in California and of two-year colleges. Also, if you take a look at the age of respondents, the um, highest percentage was 18 to 21 year olds, uh, 22 percent. However, the majority of the students, almost 80 percent, were over 21 years of age. And that was important because when you have nearly 80 percent of the students being over 21, your best enrollment, your best recruitment strategy is not going to be recruiting directly from high schools. And there often is the perception that that would be the best target audience, recruitment from high schools, high schools for community colleges, except the average community college student nationally is age 29. And so when the sites could see that most of their students, the majority, were not coming directly from high school, they could better focus on a target market for recruitment that was reflective of who was already showing up at their two-year colleges. And so that was very revealing. Now the other thing that I'd like to show you is the, the work situations of the respondents. And you can see that 32% of the respondents worked more than 40 hours a week while going to school. That is a very high number. And it helps to explain why when uh, one of the schools held a separate event for female students around connecting with other women in technology and female role models, they got low attendance because they just did not have the bandwidth to attend a separate event. And so they, they realized they needed to incorporate that into the class, have a female role model that could speak to both the male and female students, and then students could talk with her after the class. And so that's what they did. Because if you're working more than 40 hours a week and going to school, and possibly, as you can see here, we had also a high percentage of uh, students who had children, 38%, then it's really going to be very hard for you to have a dedicated activity that's separate. It's really important to integrate it into the classroom. So when the colleges we were working with got this kind of data, it really informed their interventions. Now finally, we're able to see on the recruitment side of things what efforts had the greatest impact. And the um, female students were asked how they had heard about their programs. And the uh, top strategy was that they actually heard about it from an instructor, personal encouragement, 46%. 29% heard about it from a technology, from a counselor or advisor. And so uh, that was also a form of personal encouragement. Number two strategy were the female role model posters, 40%, that were an important part of the project as well. Now, before we move to the question and answer period, I want to mention a note of caution if you choose to administer a survey such as this to your female students. Because even if you make it anonymous, if the N is very low, of female students, and maybe you only have one or two or even three or four in a program, then in reality, you know, that is not an anonymous survey. And it includes confidential information that could harm or even backfire against a female student. And so you must be very careful about how it is collected and who it's shared with, who it's collected by, and who it's shared with. And we had a situation with one of our colleges where there are only two female students in the program, we knew that. And so we provided them only with composite data across the eight colleges and not their own individual data. And so that's how we handled it. So I really want to underscore 
the importance of this if you're considering doing something along these lines. OK, well, we now have another opportunity for questions. So let's go ahead with our next Q&A segment. OK, thanks, Donna. That was a lot to absorb. So we did have a few uh, questions here to go over. And I think one, um, looking back through the uh, list, we had one from Rick uh, concerning uh, the averages and how if you were having trouble to uh, get the total n, then uh, how did you compute the averages? Well, we had the average number of women per course in a particular course. So let's say we had CNIT 103. And CNIT 103 has uh, multiple sections. Then we knew for CNIT 103 that, for example, there was an average of 3.4 women. <laughs> uh, across those sections. And then if we had uh, multiple courses, as we always did, then we then the external evaluators took an average of, uh, you know, and combined them. And so that was how, uh, the, that's how come we had uh, not an exact n, but an average number per course. So I hope that um, clarifies that. OK, very good. Thank you. Um, and also, so then one other question, then we'll move on. How did you define the positive classroom environment in the training for instructors? Ah, you have to come to the training for that. There's many things, <laughs> really, that, uh, that go into a positive classroom environment, many. Um, we uh, do an entire. We have both, I'll talk more about the training towards the end, but uh, we do a whole day when we do in-person on uh, retention. And it, it's, uh, it's not something I can, I can boil down. It's really so many of the different pieces uh, from the learning style, including female learning style, to uh, how to ensure the females are included in the lab, to sending um, uh, a positive message in the initial weeks. There's many different components to it. Um, and I'll be talking later both about our real-time training and our online training. We now have it in a number of different formats. But it's really infused through all of our knowledge base. OK, great. So we are running a little uh, short on time. So what I'd like to do now is move on to the final section, uh, leveraging change with data. I'll turn that back over to you, Donna. And then uh, so we can take a look at that. Great. So this is our last segment. And it's on how to use data to leverage change for broadening participation. And the baseline data that the colleges collected showed that there was a small percentage of women in most of their STEM courses. And also, it identified that there was a high dropout rate. And this really enabled these colleges to sound the alarm bell, so to speak, about women in STEM in their college and how important it was to take action and make change. And it also enabled these schools to really get people interested in being on their leadership teams for the Cal Women Tech Project. Each of the schools had to develop a leadership team of administrators, teachers, instructors, counselors um, and educators who committed to participating in the project and helping with the strategic plan and implementation of strategies. And so they actually used the data to generate interest in becoming a Cal Women Tech leadership team member. And the leadership team is really critical for making lasting institutional change. And I don't have time to go into the details on that in this uh, particular webinar, but we do go in depth in our Women Tech Educators training about the leadership team. So this really helped, again, provide some leverage for getting people to realize, hmm, this is really important, and we need to become team members and work on a solution. 
Now, the other thing that I found uh, was important was having these kind of outcome numbers kept the leadership team focused on the outcomes and not just the process. Because so often in projects on women and girls in STEM, people will say, well, we put up a poster with female role models. You know, we put up a flyer. We had one female role model speaker, so we're doing what we can. But they don't actually really have the information and data they need to say if it worked and if it actually increased for enrollment and completion. But because we have this data, they saw that they really had to focus not only on the process but on actual outcomes and to keep working until they saw change in both the enrollment side of things and also on retention completion. And as I mentioned earlier, it took um, a year to two on the enrollment side of things. And of course, uh, on the retention side of things, they were able to actually see some changes a little bit more quickly. Now, I just want to also mention that having this kind of data really uh, helped us with keeping um, in mind our ultimate goal, which was actually increased enrollment and retention of female students in STEM. Now, one thing that I want to talk about also was that, especially at our smaller colleges, sometimes on the completion side of things, you could see if there was just one instructor teaching a particular course, that the problem was that with that particular instructor. Uh, I was, I'm thinking about one example where we identified over several semesters, or I should say external evaluators identified, but we relayed the information that this particular uh, instructor had a dropout rate that was in the 60 to 70 percent range. And actually, it was the schools themselves that knew it was an instructor. And this gave the dean leverage to work with that instructor so that they could change their teaching practices so that they would not be losing the majority of their students. And the administrators really appreciated that because they were able to take action based on this type of data from our external evaluators. But we, as the outside technical assistance providers, were the ones who had to deliver the less than favorable results. And so that gave them additional help and leverage in that area. Now, I also want to give the case of City College of San Francisco. And in that case, uh, I actually would present the enrollment and completion data to the instructors. And that school was really successful in getting almost 100% attendance at some trainings that I did, World Tech Educators trainings, and also some follow-up support and strategy sessions. And they both got full-time faculty as well as adjunct. And the numbers at baseline, especially for the females, were not very good. And they really used the data around retention to come up with a plan uh, based on the knowledge base that I trained them on to help improve the retention. And then when I did the follow-up support and strategy sessions and coaching with them, and show them the positive numbers, that really inspired them to keep going. And in the aggregate, they actually had a 14.4% increase in retention for their female students. So in that case, the data was really a motivator to keep going. And I want to emphasize that the data really validated their strategies, and it enabled them to be celebrated. And they themselves were so excited to see the retention rates of their female students and actually their male students go up and see that their hard work had paid off. And they ended up being featured by not only our organization, but also by the National Science Foundation when they highlighted us, and by their own college, City College of San Francisco. So I really want to emphasize here that data was not only used as a uh, leverage to get instructors who are having difficulties with retention to change, it was also used to validate and celebrate instructors as they made those changes and reap the rewards. Now, before we go into our next question and answer segment, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the training that educators received as part of our Cal One Tech project. And all eight of the colleges received the One Tech Educators training. And as part of the training itself, uh, they 
develop a recruitment plan and a retention plan on the spot that is customized to their specific programs. And we actually have this training available outside of the project. We offer it in different formats. Our next in-person training is coming up on June 21st and 22nd in the San Francisco Bay Area, where we are located. And it's a great opportunity to network with other educators from around the country and share strategies about increasing the number of women in your classrooms. And we also have something new, um, which is our Women Tech Educators online training. We actually just finished a cycle of that. We got great feedback about it. It's over a 10-week period, and it's one hour per week. And when you sign up, you actually, again, also develop a recruitment and retention plan during the actual online training. And you work at your own pace in the online training. And you also have interactive parts where you have an opportunity to connect with other educators through a private, dedicated online learning community. And our next online training starts September 10, 2012. And as I said, we've gotten really great feedback from the online training participants who just finished. And you can see on the screen the URL for our web page that describes all our different training options. We can also send a trainer on site to a college or a region or district to provide the training to you at your location. So if you're with a college or a program where you'd like to see more female students in your STEM courses, then this online or in-person training might be an option for you. And if you're an evaluator and you work with a program that has very few women in it, this could be a good choice for that program to help them see the kind of results I've been telling you about. And again, you see the web address on your screen. And that will point you to more information, including the sample training agendas, the learning outcomes, and everything else you need to know. Now, I also have a special announcement, which is that some of you on this webinar or listening to it afterwards might qualify for a scholarship to one of these NSS ATE hosted trainings. And the workshop content is the same uh, as for our national training and our online training. These trainings do have an application process which you will need to complete. And something that's really important about these NSS ATE hosted trainings is they include six months of follow-up support to help you implement the recruitment and retention plans that you develop in the training itself. For the Boston training hosted by Baytech, um, I encourage you to apply right away uh, because priority will be given to those who apply early. And you see the link there for SurveyMonkey. That's how you apply. Uh, there's also a training that we're doing that is being sponsored by MPIC. And that will be in Fremont, California, June 25th through 29th. Uh, MPIC is mostly for those in the ICT field. However, I've got a special announcement, which is that they will open this up to any STEM-related program. However, there are some geographic limitations. It needs, they need to be from a community college in southern Nevada, northern Oregon, or Hawaii. And it includes travel expenses. This is not true for Baytech. Baytech does not include travel expenses. But it is true for MPIC. And so I wanted to let you know about that great opportunity. Again, you should uh, go to their website to get more information. There's also an application process. And uh, both of our hosts will be uh, determining who will be participating based on an NSF scholarship. OK. So let's move on to our last question and answer period. And I'm happy to answer any questions about any of our trainings or about any of the information that I have just gone over so far, or just any more general questions about recruitment and retention. OK, great. Thanks, Donna. So we just had a clarification um, about an earlier question. And that was uh, some of the participants are still unclear about the use of averages versus total numbers. So was that your external evaluators, uh, evaluator's decision to use those course averages instead of total numbers? Or was that just how the colleges were able to provide their data to you? It was a combination of both. Uh, that it was uh, our external evaluator's decision to use averages based upon what the community colleges could provide. And oh, okay. so only the, and so and again, 
uh, the only way that the community colleges could provide it was based upon per course and uh, not based upon also uh, a unique identifier that would enable them to see if they were looking at uh, unique women or different women across multiple programs. So it was really an interactive dynamic um, with what they could provide, what our National Advisory Committee had recommended, understanding what, having a deep knowledge of what most community colleges, uh, how they collect their data and what their capacity was. And uh, we also had raised this proactively with them in the meeting because in our previous, we, we're now on our fourth NSF-funded project, I'm happy to say, but in our second uh, project, also working with two-year colleges, we had tried to collect data uh, that actually showed persistence, but we were not successful in doing so. And so we specifically raised with them what is the best way to do this uh, based upon what community colleges can provide. So it was really synergistic. OK, great. Thanks. Uh, I think that clarified the answer for some people. So in lightning round fashion, I'll just cover the last few wrap-up questions here. Uh, so briefly, has the survey been published, or is it available for review? We have not published the survey. Um, it's something that I may do in the future. I have actually published uh, uh, other assessment tools that um, we have used in other projects. This really. Uh, requires a lot of instruction because of the dynamic that I mentioned, which is that uh, one needs to be very careful about who they're sharing the data with, et cetera. And so this is something that is uh, on the agenda for the future, but it's not something that uh, we currently have funding to do, so it's still something that we um, plan to do in the future. OK. Also, so next question, uh, did you find that increasing women's success increased minority success as well as men's success? Uh, so I know so, it's a complicated question, but perhaps a short answer. That's actually what I can answer. So what I can tell you is that, as I showed you earlier, two-thirds of the female uh, participants in the survey were women of color. And so although we did not uh, survey male students, I think it's um, pretty safe to assume that there is a similar demographic makeup of male students. And so what I can also tell you is that we did measure completion rates for males. And as I mentioned, that uh, we actually improved completion rates uh, for, all, for males as well as for females. And uh, so we can assume that the majority of the males were also males of color. And so yes, it's not surprising that these strategies that uh, we use to improve retention rates of females, uh, they were also drawn upon from the proven practices and the literature on increasing minority participation in STEM. And so it's not surprising that it also worked for males and that they actually, um, I, I mentioned earlier, four out of the seven uh, schools improved retention of females and actually uh, improve retention for all of the males across all the schools. And so that was a wonderful ancillary benefit that uh, we didn't actually anticipate, but we're very happy to find. And it made sense because we've drawn upon those strategies that um, have been successful in minority uh, programs. OK, excellent. So those were some excellent questions. We won't get necessarily time to cover everybody's remaining questions. Perhaps we could email them to you, Donna, and then you could uh, provide a response for any that we don't have the opportunity to directly answer here in the webinar. Sure, uh, I'd be so, happy to do that. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so as you probably know, and as Lori mentioned earlier, we love to do surveys and we love to do evaluation here at Evaluate. Uh, so what we'd like you to do now is take a moment to reflect on our one minute uh, survey about this webinar. Um, and so I'll just sort of keep an eye on the one minute time uh, limit there. And then while we're answering the survey, uh, Donna, perhaps you could just briefly note if you used any control groups in your studies or uh, during the evaluation. Yes. So 
we um, again, uh, I think using control groups uh, is great. We uh, that was outside the scope of our project. I guess the closest that we came to um, a control in, in the sense on the completion side was that we were also doing a comparative with uh, male base, male numbers as well. But in terms of uh, doing a, a control group in the formal sense that you're probably referring to, that was something that, again, was not within the scope or capacity of this particular project. OK. Well, excellent. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so we're going to be closing the survey in approximately about 15 seconds. Uh, so go ahead and finish up those uh, surveys and get ready to uh, submit the results. And we'll be closing in five, four, three, two, and one. OK, so thanks, everybody. We really appreciate your feedback. Um, so on behalf of Evaluate, I'd like to tell you all a little bit about our upcoming webinars, uh, given that we're running uh, short on time. August 15th, please note this is a new date that's outside of the time of our regular webinars, our normal July webinar. This one will be about building a better ATE proposal with evaluation and logic models built in. We'll immediately follow that with a webinar on September 19th, Introduction to ATE Evaluation for New ATE PIs. You may register for those at www.evaluate.org forward slash events. Also, the American Evaluation Association hosts a Coffee Break webinar series. On May 31st, they'll be covering evaluative thinking. And on June 21st, they'll be covering making evaluation findings actionable in order to improve practice. These short webinars are really useful for building evaluation skills. And if you're not a member of the American Evaluation Association, you can get more information or join at www.eval.org. Also, I'd like to draw your attention to our digital resource library at evaluate.org. We have an evaluator directory. We also have links to our upcoming events and archival copies of our uh, quarterly Evaluate newsletter. So uh, to wrap up, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today on behalf of myself, on behalf of Lori Wingate, and on behalf of Donna Milgram. I'd like to thank everybody for participating. And I will definitely make sure that any remaining questions get emailed. And you should expect an email shortly. And also be looking for those uh, handout emails in your email. Hopefully everyone has a great day, and take care.